walk in the cloud. The UK has a productivity problem. Statistics tell the tale. We rank fourth in the G7 behind the US, Germany, and France. A whopping 20% behind the Americans. What's going on? And more importantly, what can we change to put the brakes on this spiral of decline? That's the topic for today's Walk in the Cloud. I'm your host, Ellen Benkard, and I'm here today with Richard Postens, one of the authors of an Accenture report on this very hot and very concerning topic. Welcome, Richard. Good to be here, Ellen. Richard, first up, are these numbers for real? I mean, my team works just as hard here in London as the team I left years ago in Missouri. Is this just bad measurement? Well, I'm glad you asked because productivity is, an, is a word that everyone thinks they know what they mean. It's used in self-help. You can't help but see it in every social media platform. But what productivity means is how much is kept by workers per hour. And in that sense, you realize that people who are doing high value tasks, people who are doing high value manufacturing versus lower value tasks, perhaps serving in, uh, in service industries, they don't earn as much money per hour. It's as simple as how much do workers keep of the value they generate. And in that sense, American workers are driving a lot more dollars per hour than we're able to do here in the UK. Okay, so this is clearly a much more complicated topic than most people think it is. So let's start with your paper that says that technology can bring 33 billion pounds in business potential on this productivity issue. Now, the IT industry has been promising technology and productivity for a long time. What's different now? Where are you getting that 33 billion? Well, I think it's a fair call for a start, right? Technology does have amazing potential. And let me start with that 33 billion number. I mean, that 33 billion is huge. To give you a sense, it's potentially doubling the gross value add, or the way we measure the UK's productivity, if we deploy these types of technologies at this sort of level. And what types of technology are you talking about here? So really this is about how do we use technology to allow the humans to do the most difficult stuff. So if you think it's most easily thought of in a manufacturing sense, if you had people hand making all the items on a production line in the olden days, instead if you're able to use technology to automate many of those tasks, one person can now do the output of 10 people. That's productivity but we apply it in five specific areas in the paper. So it's not just manufacturing where that can take place. Service industries, how does someone use something like ChatGPT or AI to automatically respond to perhaps 80 or 90% of queries, but those that genuinely need a human in the loop, use a human. So that's a great example of how a human could drive 10 times more output. And it's not just in service industries, it's across a whole range of processes in the papers. And we take a look really at quite a specific detail about what tasks can be done by machines, what better by humans, and that gives us this figure of 33 billion pounds. So ChatGPT has brought generative AI into the news, but you know we know that it's AI has been around for a long time. Can I put ChatGPT to the side for a moment and talk about what's happening right now? Can you give me some examples? of any industries or companies that are actually using technology to take productivity jumps today. And I think that's a really good point about ChatGPT, right? There's walk, jog, run. And here in the UK, we've suffered because we've had cheap labor and we've had uncertainty. And the combination of these two, in the face of uncertainty, you don't normally make capital investments. And goodness knows in the UK, we've had uncertainty. But we've also had cheap labor. The UK as the destination of choice because people often speak it as a second language has meant we've had cheap labor. So the UK has been really bad. We've had the same technology, but we haven't turned it into value. So whether that specific example is, if you have a large mobile workforce, how do I always get the right person to the right job at the right time? It's less sexy, right? To get a right first time rate of 90%, not 70%. It doesn't sound as cool as ChatGPT, but actually re-engineering your business so that with the right data, you get the right people to do the job right first time. There's a good example of how technology 
can deliver real productivity. You can think of the waste that would be avoided by people turning up to jobs they can't do. Now, I don't want you mentioning any specific client names here because this is the kind of stuff people want to keep under wraps. But can you give me any examples of the types of projects we might be working on right now that are helping people? For sure. What, what changes are people making? So you can think of an example. We've got a large client that is rolling out a massive fiber network. It doesn't sound like the sort of thing that you'd be applying. Tech. You know, these are people who wear orange every day. Okay? We're working with them, and by a many small increments, applying the right data, the right insights in the right place, in partnership with them, help them save 400 million pounds and able to deliver a 25% productivity increase. I mean, that is such a step change, and it's great for the UK, because actually it enables us to deliver our infrastructure for less. It's great for the people employed, because it means we can afford their wages. But it's also great for the companies, because then they're able to go faster, which is another flip side to this productivity equation. In a world where we've got constrained talent, productivity doesn't just help you get, do it cheaper, it helps you do it faster. Now, every wave of new technology from you know, the hoe to the spinning jenny to now, people are always afraid, my job is going to go away. Um, and it sounds like what you're saying there is that the jobs get better more productive. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It's, yeah, for can, sure. Can you put fears at ease a little bit? I think we've been, you have to begin by recognizing that change is always scary. Change is always scary for the people involved. Now, if you recognize that change is scary, there are ways to approach it. Okay, There is the potential for people to have more skilled jobs where they do more of the things that are the real problem-solving elements and less of the things that are more mundane. But equally, there are possibilities, and I've seen it, where people don't think about those human elements and projects come to a grinding halt. Because ultimately, productivity is about increasing the productivity of the workforce you have, not creating the workforce you'd like to have. And why that matters is you've got to take the people with you on this journey. So let's talk about skills there, because if people aren't complaining about productivity in this country, they're often complaining about education and talent. Mm -hmm. um, do we have the skills that we need to work with the next generation of technology in the UK? And if we don't, what do we do to get them? I think of it in two layers, actually. I think there's the leadership skills of executives and boards. Okay, In the UK, I think we could be a lot better at setting an ambition for what a business looks like enabled by digital. I see when I do in my, some of my global work, organizations that are much, more, much braver in setting a digitally enabled future as part of their vision. And what differentiates them? Different questions, different personalities? Well, I think it's the other, it's the other things I'd say on the list. Partly you've got ambition. Mm -hmm. I think you've got board skepticism on investment. I do think that the over-promise and under-deliver of many technology projects has been a problem. But actually, you've then got execution and delivery. Because I do think that execution absolutely matters. And I think it's, it's a muscle you have to build. I think many of us respect some of the behaviors we see in the German manufacturing sector, for example. They seem to be able to repeatedly build production lines that make great use of technology, that create high quality goods at a great price point. Again, the US, with a very large market with a common language and few barriers, is able to invest in technology. Whereas I see in the UK, we've been a bit slower at that, to get that, that triumvirate of the right ambition, the right investment, but then the execution and delivery that makes it actually all happen. So that's the board. Let's talk about the workers now. Yeah. What about the skills for the people on the front line? That's where I come back to that point about uncertainty and the particular thing we've had in the UK about the ability to import talent if needed. Almost, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the idea of a golden constraint. People that don't have English as their first language don't have an endless pool of workers that speak their local language, so they have to invest in skills. Partly here in the UK, with the uncertainty of the future, as I said, and perhaps the ability to, to get immigrant workforce, it allowed us to not invest in skills. So there is a gap, I would say, but smart companies are recognizing that they have a business transformation agenda enabled by technology and talent, not a technology agenda. 
I want to ask about cost. Yeah. Because cost is usually um, not enabling but restraining. And we're in, we've been dancing around recession, whether or not we're technically in it. And technology usually means investment. Is cost going to hold the UK back? I think if it's done in the old fashioned way, yes. If you think about the old fashioned way, it would say, Ellen, I'm going to do this project for you over the next three years. Give me tens of millions of pounds, and at the end of those three years, I will magically reveal some results. I think all of us have realized that that doesn't really make great sense, does it? Whereas with modern techniques that are highly iterative, okay, an iterative, i.e. it's about execution. I have an ambition, I secure a first wave, I deliver results, that builds momentum. So iterative approaches, I would suggest, are fundamental to unlocking that cost. It will cost money, but the scale and potential of value that's there is huge. And I think that will be what will differentiate the winners from the losers those that are able to set, invest in, and execute that digital ambition. So I love ending our walk on a positive note, and it sounds like there is there's a good future to be worked for there. Absolutely. And I think the thing is we're not suggesting people do something that has never been done. We're actually just saying there are people doing this already. All you need to do is copy that successful template of a digital ambition incremental investment and iterative delivery that focuses on execution. It's absolutely there. And again, as a UK resident and an adopted UK resident, I think it's a real moment of opportunity for us. Well, I have both passports these days and I would very much like them to be at parity on the productivity stakes. So thank you for taking a walk with me today, Richard. And uh, to all of you out there listening, do us a favor. If you like our podcast, click on whatever's offered in the platform you're using to show that help others discover us. And if there's something specific you'd like me to discuss, drop me a suggestion at ellen.bencard at Accenture.com, and I will go through our massive list of clever people here and find somebody who can talk about it. And now, everybody back to work. We've got some productivity to make up. See you next time. Walk in the cloud. 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 Walk in the cloud.